I think we are live on Facebook. Let me just make sure. And let's start. So, Marcel, thank you. I'm just checking. Yes, we are live. So, Marcel, thank you for joining us and accepting our invitation. Uh, so here we go uh, again in another viral uh, or virtual fireside chat with Startup Grant. It has been a while since we did a lot of uh, virtual uh, fireside chats and event uh, through during COVID. And since COVID was out, so we, we forgot how to do those kind of things. And sorry for the delay, but now everything is settled. So uh, again, Marcel, thank you for your time and for accepting our invitation. Uh, so, could you please uh, share share with us what you were saying? So, where are you now? What you are doing before? I really do the big introduction for you. Okay, no problem. I'm here in Brussels. We are celebrating our 25th year of our largest European business angel federation called IBAN. I sit on the board of IBAN and. Um, we just had our election and I've been reelected for the next two years. So, so far, so good. And we had like 700 delegates, a mix of European business angels, about 25 scale up from Europe. And the meeting happened inside the European Commission. And therefore, we had some uh, what you call European commissioners uh, interested always about early stage investments and how can we develop the European ecosystem when it comes to early stage investments. So thank you again. And uh, for the people that have joined our uh, fireside chat, whether by chance or by mistake, or were except, ex expecting uh, Marcel, so few words about Marcel. So he's currently the Zofia Business Angels President, Emeritus, IBAN Board Member, uh, Europe AI Capital Board Member, MG Band founder, Med Angels founder, but also he's a seasoned European sales senior executive. Marcel, ha Marcel have a substantial field experience helping IT telecom startups in the US and the EMEA. Marcel has a broad range of experience in all aspects of sales, marketing, communication, management, with direct experience with Fortune 500 enterprises and a lot of experience and of course he knows a little bit and well not even a little bit about our local ecosystem the tunisian ecosystem and he has already collaborated with a couple of sso's and ecosystem uh, local ecosystem active players so again thank you for your time i know you have a busy agenda and we really appreciate your time and your availability and let's start with the first question so for the people that are watching us again thank you for waiting for the technical uh, issue and maybe this is one thing that we do when we are a startup we always adjust and try to find a way in it's not always smooth. So now I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Marcel. We're going to have our fireside chat. But of course, at the end, feel free to ask your question and we are here to answer. So first of all, let's start, Marcel, about your career journey and transition. You begin your career as an engineer before transitioning to sales and entrepreneurship. At the beginning, when we I contacted you, I was always thinking that you have a bank a background in finance, something like that. I wasn't expecting like an engineering. So for this transition, can you share what you motivated you to this shift and how it shaped your current approach to fostering innovation in startups? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bahia. This really absolutely and amazing i'm humbled and i'm really pleased and thrilled uh, to coming and uh, share my humble experience with my sisters and brothers from tunisia um, as an algerian you can imagine what tunisia means a lot to us and um, so i was there from day one and um, i can blame it on a very good friend of mine that all of you know he is the father of the tunisian startup uh, act mr norman ferry himself uh he's the one who basically invited me long time ago uh we were connected to biat we were connected to flat six lab we did um an amazing stuff with Kalpa business angel 
and that lately I was involved with all the AI cohort of Innovation City in Sus with our friend uh, Hisham Turkey. Uh, I know the dot very well. I use it as a headquarter when I come and visit Tunisia. And on top of that, my wife is Tunisian. So what else can I say <laughs> about my love to uh, <laughs> Tunisia? Um, I was always impressed about a small country like Tunisia, uh, how much innovation is going on there, how many bright people is going there, um, the whole like smart capital, uh, the fund of funds. Um, I'm just amazed about, uh, about what, what you guys are doing. Anyhow, about me, yes, indeed, I was uh, at Portsmouth Polytechnic in the UK a long time ago. Apparently, I used to have hair. I don't have any hair anymore. And um, I became an engineer. Uh, I visited the customer with the sales guy. I fixed his technical issue in those years. And um, he told me he was a salesman. And I said, what do you do? And he says, well, thanks to bright people like yourself fixing my technical issue, um, I'm going to get a purchase order. I'm going to get a, a commission check. I'm going to send my kids to school. I'm going to go to Club Med. I'm going to be skiing. I'm going to be golfing. And thanks to you. And then he added something really, really uh, an aha moment for me when he said, you know what? The most successful sales guys of tech, they are engineers. So, you know, in, a, in French, we say la messe edit. So that was the day where I started looking at the VC world of Series A, Series B in the West Coast of the US, because all those VCs had portfolio companies of tech companies uh, wanting to come to Europe, Middle East, and Africa. That's what we call the EMEA region. Um, and I was humbled, I was lucky. Did I hear something? Yes, sorry, it was me testing something. Sorry, go okay. ahead. So, you're hearing me good so far? Yes, perfect, loud and clear, perfect, thank you. Excellent, excellent. So, I decided to be a salesman. I would say started with business development and what we call a technical uh, a consultant engineer. So, I was really much more involved with the customer problem solving, uh, visiting banks, uh, telecom, SMEs, even at that time, what you call system integrators, like Accenture, Wipro, Tech Mahindra, uh, trying to basically educate them what kind of technology we used to have. So anything you can think of. Uh, this drive back in the 90s, going into PCs, going in the local area networking, then going into the WAN, wide area networking, going all the way to the beginning of the internet in 1995, where I was lucky uh, to be meeting uh, amazing, amazing startup. So I'm going to be mentioning a couple of them. The most famous one is Ascend Communication, uh, where basically we created from scratch the internet service provider business around the world. We went from zero after four years to $1.7 billion. And we sold the company to Lucent Technology in 1999 for $21 billion. So if you Google, uh, as we speak, Lucent, and then space Ascend, you will see uh, that particular information. And then I was uh, really humbled because 2000, the whole thing crashed, talking about uh, crisis and opportunities. When the whole NASDAQ crashed, the tech company crashed, the bubble, amazing. So I started looking and said, what is the next step thing for me? A company called Airspace was trying to resolve a Wi-Fi uh, uh, architecture problem, and we uh, find this amazing uh, IP called LWAP, Lightweight Access Protocol, and we decided single-handedly to target Cisco as a competitor. So think about uh, an elephant and a mouse, and I hope that some entrepreneurs in Tunisia get inspired when you have that kind of size. You say, you know, how come that a mouse can really do a disrupting uh, thinking and gets the big elephant? So uh, we bit them in many, many accounts in, in that particular area called Wi-Fi infrastructure. And then four years later, we did $16 million worth of revenue, and we got acquired north of $1.7 billion. And uh, I thought I was going to uh, leave the whole big picture of Cisco, but Cisco kept me. 
they felt that I need to be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. after doing, doing so many startups. So I stayed at Cisco for eight years, and then I uh, decided to be a business angel. And um, you said something interesting about finance and engineering. Well, I thought maybe I needed finance if I wanted to invest and start a business angel. So in 2013, I did two things. I went to INSEAD, I did an MBA, executive MBA, to really understand the whole financial acumen lack that I had, at the same time understand how merger and acquisition works. And I became a business angel with a club called Sophia Business Angels, and Sophia came from Sophia Antipolis, which is the largest scientific park in Nice, in the south coast of France. And the club of Sophia Business Angels, SBA, we just finished our 20th anniversary, still there. And I've learned so much, they decided to ask me to be president, so two times two years. And then I became a board member of the largest federation of European Business Angels based in Brussels. And that's what I am currently. And um, as we speak, my beautiful wife, Tunisian, decided to go to Doha, Qatar, to launch the first VC of Qatar. So they just launched Rasmel Ventures, which is a $100 million fund uh, anchored by Qatar uh, Investment Authority. And me wanting to be busy, guess what? I'm back to what I like doing, mentoring startups, investing in startups, and I'm become the advisor to Qatar Development Bank in the incubation, acceleration, and investment. So I hope I made it all clear to you, my background and how I became uh, an investor, a business angel, and a mentor. Wow, very clear and uh, very uh, interesting, especially I kept, I was taking some notes, especially the word of entrepreneur, because we don't talk much about entrepreneurship. So we always talk about entrepreneurship and people starting something and leaving their job and starting the side hustle and then become, but keeping let's say corporate job, why be an entrepreneur? This isn't something that we see a lot or talk about it a lot. And uh, speaking about that, so could you tell me please what challenges did you face during these initiatives or how, do, how did you overcome all of them to ensure a successful outcome? Um, interesting. So uh, I've learned both, uh, both inside uh, small companies uh, in startups and in big companies like Cisco one of the most amazing thing that uh, you know you you have you need to be really humble to understand it technology as you can imagine i can write a book about the whole concept of starting uh, the whole shift from anal- analog to digital all the way to fiber all the way to optical all the way to cyber security all the way to ai today so i can write a book about technology but something it's amazing that really, really kind of helped me uh, um, just avoid all those obstacles. It's all about the human capital. It's all about the interaction of, with people and understanding that in that environment, be it in a startup when you're building a team or being in an SME or big corporate, a lot of politics, a lot of what I call toxic toxicity uh, in the communication style of some people and you learn with life that you need to have a very, very clear, crisp communication style of saying, listen, um, at the end of the day, it's all about teamwork. You know, I look at my hand, five fingers, they're all different. And uh, I think in Arabic, we say, um, and I'm using it a lot in my mentorship by saying, guys, you can be the best techie in the world. You can be the best finance guy in the world. But if you're not humble and do a SWOT analysis on yourself and and decide and say, I am bloody good at this. I'm a techie, but I'm so lousy in any other things. Well, guess what? Founders are challenged to build an amazing team. I mean, that's what I've learned in in, in my humble career. So uh, a crisp type of communication, be a team player, avoid toxic people uh, and just move on. And then the belief, the belief is to say, 
come hell, come rain, um, the word impossible does not exist. I have to find a shortcut. I have to have, uh, you know, a way of um, uh, schmoozing people. I like the word schmoozing. It's, it's a very good word, actually, meaning that you need to give the impression to the team surrounding you or even your management that we are all going in the right direction. One of the framework I'm using is called the VSCM framework, a V for vision. All of us are capable of having a vision. And um, especially if we're talking about startups, as an example, even the big companies have that. A vision in general, you wake up one day and you say, I want to change the world, or I want to tackle a problem. And that vision is very crisp and clear. And that vision doesn't change much as you're building your company, because it becomes the culture of your environment. And that's how you're hiring good people around you. Uh, S is for strategy. And um, a lot of people struggle with changing strategy. Strategy is there to be changed. You know, when you're brainstorming uh, with your team, if you feel that you are uh, from a go to market perspective, you say, hey, uh, we're doing direct direct sales, or we're going a SaaS model, or we're going uh, a white labeling, or we're doing an OEM type. There's nothing wrong if you feel that you are losing or, or failing is to reset yourself, pivot, and then and try something else. So strategy changes. But here's the two last uh, words, E for execution and M for metrics or KPI. Uh, a lot of people fail, including me, and you need to learn from your failure. Um, if somebody tells you you need to have uh, version software 1.2 uh, in the next 45 days, that's the CTO technical team uh, mandate, um, you have to execute towards that. If your salesman says, I'm forecasting $500,000 in Q2, well, guess what? You have to make sure that you are uh, doing that. And most of companies fail because they're not executing. And execution for me is across the team. Um, from the receptionist, if you have a receptionist or an assistant, all the way to the marketing team, the technical team, the sales team, BD team, finance, HR, you name it, and the CEO as well. Um, a founder, CEO, as an example, uh, need to be all the time in touch with two type of people, prospect for customers acquisition and early stage investment, and then VCs for later investment. That's what I'd say to the founders all the time. Uh, there's not magic rule by saying, uh, let me fix my product, let me maybe do some proof of concept before I start talking to investors. You are talking to investors even at the ideation stage. Very interesting. And thank you for the EVESM uh, uh, model that it's really interesting. And it's like we say, 360. So it's cover the beginning, the vision, then how we implement it. Uh, and with the execution, of course, you need to have a strategy. And one mistake that is done by all of us startups or even big corporation that we, did, we don't measure KPIs or we don't measure the right KPIs and it doesn't allow us to move forward. Exactly. Uh, and so regarding all of the, those experiences, what uh, or in which way those experiences have influenced you in your current approach, especially that you are advising startup and fostering them? Um, I think um, uh, if I have to really understand uh, between the lines of your question, um, I meet, uh, I mean, I was in Brussels for two days, I meet like about um, 50 different startups and I've listened to maybe 25 pitches. This is just for two days, right? Um, when I go to Qatar, there is uh, five incubators there. Uh, if I go to Jitex uh, in Dubai, Jitex Africa in, in Morocco, or even go to Mobile World Congress in, in Barcelona. So I'm meeting all the time founders. And in Tunisia, I met a lot of bright people, uh, especially in, uh, in uh, Novation City uh, with AI. And what I've noticed is, uh, as an investor, as a mentor, I focus a lot, a lot, on the quality of the team. You know, you remember what people are expecting you saying, oh, are you a space tech guy? Are you investing in agri-tech, in AI? You know, it doesn't matter what it is. So.
it does not work that way. So one of the things I've done in Tunisia, and thanks to Norman and thanks to the ecosystem, I said, make sure that at least you have one local person that believed in your project. It's very, very important because that person, I bet you, he's somehow connected to the international investors community. And I can give you a lot of examples when, when, I, when, when I talk about how that relationship between investors and founders works. So um, the team is important to me. Uh, I would say the uh, concept of blue ocean is important to me. What's blue ocean? Uh, don't do a me too company. Please, please, please. Days are gone when you're doing a me too company. Try to understand where is that niche market that you can actually serve and you can be the first one into that market because you understood uh, what is that unique business value proposition and therefore the competition will come after you because you were the first to go there and you have that completely freedom to be the first to be selling in that area. Having said that, competition is healthy. Uh, I, I don't like founders coming to me and saying, we're the first, we're the best. You know, you have to acknowledge uh, this is a competitive marketplace and then try to give me that unique selling point, that unique business value proposition. Why are you different from those two or three competitors in the marketplace that you're dealing with? Something else I, I like to talk about uh, Tunisia and, and Morocco and Algeria in general, I feel that most uh, Maghreb-based uh, founders, they are not ambitious enough. The best example, you have a good one like Instadeep. And when Karim started his company, I don't think he said there is a market in Tunisia. You know, I think he really, really tried to tackle a particular problem with AI that is a global problem. And, and that's what I, again, I'm pushing back to a lot of founders in our countries up in North Africa and saying, please um, uh, be brave, be courageous, be um, daring by saying, I have a technology, I have a vision, but I'm really tackling the world. I can start in Tunisia to do the small proof of concept and get some uh, kind of validation. There's nothing wrong with that. I can go adjacent to Algeria because it's a bigger market and, and try to do some sales and then Africa, and then Europe, and then the rest of the world, why not? But if you're not thinking global from day one, I would rather say, you know, you have to think twice before you start your project. So I'm always ambitious in, in, in challenging that, that founders in North Africa uh, to think different. We have to be, because we have smart people. We have some disruption capable people, well-educated people. The only thing is some, somehow, either they are introverts, nothing wrong with being introvert, or there they are shy, nothing to be shy, but they're not ambitious enough to say, I'm, I'm thinking big. Not because I want to show off or have an ego intellectually, but because I believe that I can change the world. You know, usually they're the ones with crazy ideas that I have a lot of respect when I start listening uh, to their pictures. Thank you, Mark. I was going to ask you a question, but then when you started talking about being ambition and thinking about lo thinking locally for your proof of concept, for your testing, for your crash test, but always aiming globally. But yesterday I was having a discussion with a friend of mine about a local startup that is really, it's in fintech, so it's adapted to the local laws and the environment and whole ecosystem. So does that startup also is allowed to think big, especially for them, they are covering indeed the niche problem and the, an issue with the current law for the current ecosystem. So how does the startup will be allowed to think globally since they're not covering a problem regarding the other countries? Very easy. I'll tell you very easy. I sit uh, as an advisor to Qatar Development Bank as we speak today. And if you go to their website, um, they are very, very big in investing in fintech. And we invested like 170 companies 
uh, in 17 countries. The only thing you should be aware of, I am sorry to say, that particular founder that you're talking about, when he was doing the thinking of solving a problem for the Tunisia, it's called use case. There's a particular use case that is typically in every country. But when he was doing it, well, guess what? He is technically, he is designing a concept that can be versatile, that can be changed, that can be pivoted, depending on the regulation on those use cases. So my advice for that person is very easy. He's lucky because he can research that so quickly. I mean, uh, as an example, in Qatar, we have the largest Tunisian um, uh, community uh, sitting there. A lot of them have their own startup there as well. And the original idea that they had came from Tunisia. And the only difference why they came to Qatar is because they said, Tunisia is a small market. I proved my point in certain resolving a fintech issue. And suddenly, I'm in a bigger region called MENA, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and sometimes even Turkey next door. Well, guess what? They have to be flexible. They have to be nimble. They have to be disruptive because technically they are savvy. They're clever. They know what they're doing. The only thing that you should be aware of is that logical research by saying, ah, oh, central bank in Qatar, central bank in Riyadh, central bank in UAE have different way around regulation. And most of the time, it's well understood. And they say, okay, I get it. I'm going to tweak my product in such a way. It could be Sharia compliant, as an example, part of the one of the condition. Um, and they will work it out. I have every confidence that same Tunisian entrepreneur that is doing something little for a small market in Tunisia, um, he is bright enough to do magic when it comes uh, of challenges, just because a regulated uh, a country on fintech, um, you think it might stop, stop him, but it's not true. They will figure out very, very quickly. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, an Indian entrepreneur that I'm mentoring, came from India, with the belief that one day Qatar will have regulated something interesting is called real estate tokenization. Just think about it. Any real estate can be tokenized and you'll be uh, buying a fraction of it online and speculate on it. Well, guess what? He did all his homework back home because in India it was basically not regulated and uh, it had a lot of traction but he felt that the money is in the GCC area, and that's why he wanted to do a growth. He came in for six months, lobbying. That's all what he did, not technology, because technology had it. Just lobbying uh, through uh, meetings, uh, through a concept called majlises. There's a lot of majlises in Qatar, uh, going to the right majlises and saying, hey, when is Central Bank doing this and this? And bingo, six months later, the central bank decided that tokenization for real estate it's uh, basically allowed and um, you can go ahead and uh, launch guess what being there at the right place at the right time that's what the growth is happening so my my advice to any founder sitting in tunisia um today they are luckier than i was a long time ago because we did not have internet and we could not do research um, I'm amazed how many founders are lazy not to do the proper research. Um, I, I get a, a, a bit annoyed when I say, okay, you said total addressable market is 1.7 trillion. Well done, bravo, sahtik. Um, show me the source of your information. And I laugh because most of the time it's just a finger wetted and put in the air and it's a guesswork. I'm sorry, you're not allowed to do any guesswork because those information are online. Those information are next door in your uh, incubator or accelerator. Just research, do proper research. Even if you're delayed to go to market by three months, so what? But at least you're knowledgeable that this particular market exists, you have a good market fit, and you can actually share with me, because investors love a good storytelling with facts. 
So make sure when you go facts and say at the bottom of your uh, slides, source of federation of the banking or federation of uh, transactional financial thing uh, according to this report and putting that link, well, guess what? The investor is listening and saying, wow, these guys knows his stuff. And that's how he become credible. And that's increasing the chance of him uh, having an investment as an example. Very interesting. And I'm, I will leave with the last sentence that you mentioned. And there was always keeping notes. So investors love a good storytelling and uh, with facts. So maybe this is one of the mistakes that is done by founders, that they focus on the story, storytelling and the, the aha moment and how they've come up with the idea in the niche market, especially if there is a personal story behind the launch of startups. And like you mentioned, that there is no facts, there is no key element that are using just guessing or maybe now with the, uh, with the, with the AI, uh, asking a couple of questions to chat GPT and that's it. And, and th this is bringing me to the, my next question. So, and you mentioned earlier a couple of times the word trust. So building trust between the internally that start with the CEO and, and the founder, the co-founder, the chief operating manager, all the whole team been building trust internally but one uh, of the key element is trust is critical is a critical component of investor startup relationship so what are some specific action that startups can take to build and maintain special sometimes they build and they lose but especially to build and maintain trust with their investors thank you Bahia. that is uh, that is the most uh, what's the word uh, uh, um, uh, fundamental fundamental basis of, of a good relationship between an investor, because what people forget um, is almost like a marriage. Uh, when a founder talked to an investor and they did their homework and they researched uh, the right investor for their business, uh, it's almost getting into a relationship. It's going to be a long haul. And founders, they think that I'm only asking for 50K because I have an early stage, you know, pre-seed stage I'm only looking for 50K and that's it, halas. No, um, a, a good, healthy investment uh, investor cycle with a founder, typically it's a minimum of four to five years. And if we go for a proper exit, it's seven years. That's the average, what the industry do. I have 34 startups and they, I, I, I got three exits and uh, I've lost money on 15. Typically, they, you know the maths, nine startup out of 10 go out of business the first year uh, and that and that's what people think maybe we're crazy but we 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 love we love mentoring we love giving back uh, just because life being good to us uh, once upon a time and that's what we do with uh, with our investment so the trust element starts as follow um, the guy comes to me and says i need 100k and this is how i'm going to spend them and he explained 50% maybe uh, to get uh, the next version of the software, maybe 25% maybe to hire uh, an external uh, coder. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it, the, the, the trust starts by telling a good story to the investor saying, this is what we're going to do. So it starts like that. And then they say, oh, by the way, on the customer front, we're talking to Biat Bank, let's say FinTech, or we're talking to Tunisia Telecom, if there's some interesting IT, high tech, Cyber security component, a router, switch, you don't care. Um, well, guess what? Most founders, I would say they are intellectually honest. Most founders around the world, they are intellectually honest. But can you believe that sometimes founders don't think that investors have a brain? They have to give me the benefit of the doubt that maybe I, I can make two neurons work to say, oh, okay, he's talking to Tunisia Telecom, okay. But guess what? We check it out. We'll pick up the phone. We have network. And then you'd be amazed how many times you hear things like XYZ company who? Never heard of them. So can you imagine that element of trust from day one? It's gone. And not only it's gone, Business angels are networked like a family. 
because of that trust element in the middle of it. So um, building a fantastic relationship with a founder and an investor both ways. Please, Mr. Founder, please, Mrs. Madam Founder, because we need more women in this business. Make sure fundamentally to break the bad news. You know, this did not work. Um, I tried many proof of concept. I failed. Um, I tried to talk to a couple of investments. Nobody wanted to invest in me. There's nothing wrong with that. I love stories where people are honest because that's how um, basically um, you give them that extra mileage of saying, these guys need support because they have a fantastic team. They have an amazing pro problem solving. They have a product line. Uh, they have a good traction uh, and they're just needing that extra help to mentor. It's called smart money. Now then, for that relationship to work even better, I challenge every single founder, please, that interview process should be both ways. Why are you letting an investor asking you all the questions under the sun and you're not capable of saying, excuse me, I just want to make sure that I am dealing with the right person that can help me. Could you tell me who you are? Can you give me some references where you invested, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a both way type interview, getting to know each other. And you'd be amazed again, especially in our culture, uh, North African culture, um, we're looking for that help. We're looking for that mentorship. We're looking for that check, that money, but that's it. Um, they tend to shy away, they're allowed to actually ask questions, you know, to that particular business central. Who are you? How many doors can you open to me? Uh, what is that subject matter expertise do you have? Are you a CFO type background where you can grill me on my forecast and my EBITDA type sheet and cal cal calculation, uh, financial things, uh, business model, etc., etc. Or are you a techie or, or do you have connections to big accounts, large accounts, SMEs, um, maybe you're in the fintech area, uh, uh, agriculture. Make sure that that discussion is healthy. Again, this is like a marriage between me and my wife. We talk about a lot of things and at the center of it for a good relationship is trust. If that trust is touched or, or, or severed, well, guess what? Uh, a lot of people would know about it. It's not just me as a business angel or not you as an entrepreneur. We talk to a lot of people and say that person, uh, no way uh, you should be talking to him because he told me that he's going to do this and this and this. And by the way, we gave him the first amount of money. He spent half of it on buying a car. And by the way, it does happen. Believe me, it, it, does, happen. it does happen. So long-term relationship between an entrepreneur and the business, uh, business central. It's a long haul relationship and bad news is bad news. Please, please, I always say to an entrepreneur, if you win by yourself, you will be the hero, le héros du jour. You'll be a hero and I will say congratulations to you. Well done. I always say at the same time, please do not lose by yourself. You know, if you're struggling in an account, shout out for help. If you're struggling in closing a round for that extra 25K missing, don't shy away. Go back to your early investors and ask them how to help you. Even if they don't have the cash themselves, at least they know that you're needing that extra mile of, 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 of your round to be closed. So that's how the trust element come into it. Bad news or good news. And uh, don't oversell yourself. You know, I always say lower the expectation, please, especially on the sales forecast, please lower the expectation and deliver high. That is absolutely an amazing winning formula uh, with the strengthening uh, the relationship with the investor. And remember, the investor does not give you one check. An investor is going to follow you for the next round and the next round. An investor, especially an early stage investor, 
can even introduce you to a VC when you are in the scale up mode and do that round A or round B. An investor, at least I can speak about a couple of people I know, they even can show you an exit saying after four years, you did all the right things. And then I, I, I come back to you and say, do you know what? I think you are absolutely a first class exit with the multiple X ROI with this company and this company. And let me tell you why. And sometimes it happened because the entrepreneur uh, make it sense saying, you know, maybe this is the time and, and some of them and respect, they say, no, no, we want to go that extra mile. We want to grow a company. You, you have some founders that says, I am here to build a company for legitimacy to have a long term building a business, a big company. I want to hire people. I want to go to different countries and I want to, and that's okay. But investors in general, they're looking at four, seven years maximum. If not, they just exit where they are. Um, they get their shares bought and um, they go to invest it in something else. So you can see I'm passionate, uh, I can I can answer you for it. <laughs> so uh, let me know um, if I covered your question. Uh, you covered very well, especially I, I was smiling maybe uh, subconsciously because last week I was uh, having a coffee with a friend. He's a business angel and there is a trouble with the startups that he has invested in and the world is all over, but nobody talked to him directly. And he was more disappointing that, they heard, that he had to hear it from the outside than the fact that uh, he might lose his money. So he was like kind of hurt because he felt like he just left uh, on the bench and nobody cared about him. Uh, at least, and he was saying the same word that you are mentioning, Marcel, at least talk to me directly. I could have helped. Or why should I learn it from other people? Like I'm part, kind of a part of the company. So why you are treating me like I'm not? And besides like losing the trust of your investor or your angel investor or whomever, the reputation also of your company may be hurt and harmed. Uh, and sometimes you don't even go back from there. And this is a tricky thing about some entrepreneur. They're only thinking on the short, short, short term. In Tunisia, we say uh, uh, they don't look far from their nose and they don't, it's not even long term or mid term. So they don't think even about tomorrow. And this is a true cakey thing and very interesting what you mentioned and especially reminded, I guess, several startups that relationship with an investor is not one check. And there we go. It's a really relationship. It's like getting married or Honestly, I, I always say um, the only difference between marriage, we always say, and make sure we don't fall in love with each other. I mean, that's the next sentence I ask. You know, it's, it's a business relationship and, uh, you know, uh, we have the ups and we have the down and we have our fear and doubt and we have our concerns. But I'm telling you, it's all about open communication. It's all about straightforward, you know, there is a problem there. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the guy uh, kind of uh, presumed because I am in tech, um, he never asked me, although I invested in him, he opened up a couple of verticals. And then I found out that he was struggling to sell into LVMH, uh, which is a, a fashion. And he made me laugh. He said, Marcel, I said, I, I, I'm sorry, I just overlooked the idea. You know, you worked at Cisco, you worked at Lucent Technology, you worked at IBM. You know, I'm stupid. I pretended that, you know, sorry, I killed myself by saying fashion, vertical, LVMH, uh, you know, Christian Dior, you know. No, no, no. Uh, Marcel can't help me there. He decided that for me. And what was funny is when he kind of, late, late in the game, uh, called me. He said, this is what I'm struggling with. And I'm waiting for this guy to do an intro. And I just asked him and I laughed and I said, uh, what are you trying to do? He said, there's a big, 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 big contract at LVMH. And uh, I know, and he it said it to me and at least I loved it because he was honest with me based on trust and he says, and I know I didn't want to bother you. 
uh, because you know I see that uh, your background and uh, you know you don't you don't you don't know the fashion industry, and I laughed, and I said, okay, let me tell you that the whole infrastructure on networking telecom of Elvin Marsh Group is a Cisco architecture, and I know the CISO and the CIO. CISO is the cybersecurity officer, and the CIO is the information officer. And I can see his face very embarrassed, saying, uh, wow, what? I didn't know that. I said, if you asked, you would have the answer. Because uh, between a good relationship, you say, I don't know. And usually this is how it works. I always say, I don't know. But let me think. I think I know somebody who knows. But if you don't ask the question in the first place, how would you know I can help you? So that was funny. Um, <laughs> In, in, in that networking is a scary business, you know, everybody is capable of networking with somebody that you don't even suspect that, um, you know, because they said fashion, Marcel is not uh, a fashion cool person. <laughs> That's not fashionable. <laughs> he, he, he would know. And it was funny because uh, we went straight to the number two of the company and um, we got business for them. Or maybe for this particular situation, maybe Marcel is not into fashion indeed, but maybe he's outside thinking outside the box and being outside this ecosystem or this field maybe may add uh, something or some value or some insight that nobody from the inside the business was aware of. Also, exactly. this is another point of view to look at the situation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So uh, anyway, my my take on that, um, a couple of things as well that uh, um, as an advice, as tip to uh, to a lot of entrepreneurs out there, um, when they challenged, they tend to be sometimes very obnoxious in believing that only one route to market, and they will start telling me this is absolutely a B two C business, and I'm gonna go after it. And um, I liked the business, I liked him, I liked the team, I liked the execution. And I say, you know what? I think you should be maybe thinking about a white labeling. And then they get shocked. And they say, what do you mean white labeling? Well, I say to them, do you think um, you have enough resources and enough uh, oomph in you? Do you have a lot of people around you? Do you have a lot of investment for you? to replace somebody like Siemens or somebody like Cisco, somebody like uh, Nokia, uh, where these guys own the customer anyway, but they don't have your technology. I mean, come on, you completely disrupted uh, a particular uh, use case and they would love to have it, but they have something you don't have and you have something they don't have. So how about white labeling your technology uh, to these guys, letting them calling it a Nokia 123X product line, what would you care? And basically sign a, a white labeling licensing agreement and see how it goes. And I'm telling you, a lot of startups uh, were successful because they had that kind of uh, clairvoyance in saying that, uh, you know, mentors do sometimes give you that kind of uh, aha moment uh, uh, in, in changing your strategy when it comes to uh, uh, go to market. Sometimes it's the way around. They say, hey, uh, we just want to go a SaaS. And uh, SaaS is very easy. It's a model where we have a server sitting in Tunisia. Uh, we, do, we do four languages. And uh, around the planet, they're going to click, 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 and the cell's going to come. Yeah, I, I tend to agree on what I call the basic uh, reasoning there. But one thing they're going to su be surprised to find out, if not, they're not doing that upselling, that phoning directly with that Chinese community, with that Arabic community, with that particular French community or English community, and doing that digital influencing on, 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 uh, the, on uh, the uh, social networks, if they're not writing white papers, uh, that's something else as well I, I like talking about. People don't realize if you write a white paper, you're raising your own personal brand, but at the same time, 
you are bringing more uh, sales uh, sales revenue to your company if you do it right. So 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 being a SaaS digital platform uh, technically is done and finished, but the uplifting, the actual selling, and the actual growth of revenue, you, you don't go back to bed and, and expect the miracles that uh, you know that digital platform uh, with AI automation is going to basically go like a casino for you. Uh, getting your money at 24 hours a day. It does not work that way. You still have to sweat it a little bit in making sure that you are uh, talking about you from a branding perspective, a presence in seminars, uh, uh, doing some digital influencing. Uh, it could be a TEDx discussion. It could be a white paper. It could be a roundtable discussion. That's what you're doing all the time. And then, technically, people would go to your digital SaaS uh, platform and say, you know, I'm very impressed with this particular solution and uh, it's, it can be very viral and then you get uh, get your monthly license paid and uh, off you go. And suddenly, that hockey stick growth of revenue comes in. So that even on the SaaS side, sometimes uh, people are challenged thinking that once they built it, uh, regardless where you are part of the world, I can see you. It's not true. I'm telling you, it's not true. You can stay in Tunisia, maybe uh, the next door neighbor, uh, Libya or Tunisia, uh, Algeria can see you. But I don't think you can pretend somebody sitting in Brazil will hear about you if you don't do all that um, heavy lifting. I'm just giving you examples about the go-to-market, how sometimes people are challenged uh, in, in startup world. Thank you. And I was looking of one of the questions and it goes uh, straight directly with what you were saying. So one of the people that you were watching us, Khalil, is asking where he can meet investors to present his unique project and convince them to support and participate with him in the project. So maybe start okay. with where we left that we need to do some digital presence to be up there showing your work and showing your expertise. But what else, Marcel? All right, so first of all, um, let me give you a couple of advice before you ever go to pitch. Make sure your house is in order. Uh, let me explain to you. Storytelling. Um, there's a guy um, I met uh, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, and um, he forgotten to tell me that he's a young farmer uh, belonging to a farmer generation family. Um, he completely forgotten to tell me this and he just focused on what he's building. He said, I'm building a marketplace to connect agronomists around the world with farmers. So when, when somebody starts with that statement, well, guess what? Me as an investor, yes, I can be impressed because that can be big because it's needed. But he forgotten to say the most important thing. Once upon a time, mom and dad had a farm. They had all these illnesses around their crop. The yield was poor. I came in as an engineer. I'm a digital savvy person. And I basically changed the yield using satellite pictures around my, the, the, the land. I'm bringing uh, AI into it. And I looked at him and I say, why did you forget to tell first, I am a young generation farmer belonging to a long term family, old fashioned way of farming. And therefore, there is a, a passion between me and my land. And I, said, I said, if you don't put that statement up front and straight away you jump into technology, <laughs> I'm not impressed and nobody will listen to you. So anyway, so let me go back to that question of yours. Uh, first of all, any slide that you guys worked on, doesn't matter what it is, you spend energy in developing that slide. A product architecture, how does it work? A market analysis, total addressable market, who is my competition, a market fit, a demo, a video, see how it, it doesn't matter what it is. I always say to our founders, please do not destroy or delete that slide. Keep it somewhere after an appendix slide because 
one day you will have an investor asking you that particular question to that slide and you know what to find it. However, before you start uh, pitching to other investors, I would say there's a couple of fundamental magic slides. I call them the seven magic slides. First of all, you need to make sure, um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, going fishing, you know, um, either be a, being a girl or a boy. One day, somebody, an elder, your older brother or dad says, hey, let's take a, a fishing hook and let's do some fishing. And you remember very well when you hooked that first fish. This is an image. So it's just reminding you, how does it feel? Throwing the line on the water and waiting a couple of seconds, two minutes, half an hour. But you remember all of you that thrill when something got hooked and you are trying to work. Uh... Well, guess what? That is how you should psych yourself with seven slides walking in into a pitching Zoom, remote, at an event. It doesn't matter where you go, at the incubator, at the uh, demo day. You need to start yourself there. Don't ever think you're going to pitch to get a check. Somebody is ready for the checkbook to sign. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. But just think about that fishing expedition I told you about. You are going there to hook one or two investors to show interest. That's the mission that you should be doing with that seven slides uh, uh, um, on your computer. So the first one, it's your problem. You know, what kind of problem are you trying to solve? You did some research, you went to hospitals, maybe for health tech or whatever issues that you saw there. You did what you call um, uh, a manufacturing supply chain issue. Um, with AI, you wanted to look at X-ray machines and with AI, you wanted to have a thousand X-ray uh, analyzed per minute. So it tells you if you have an illness or not. It doesn't matter. We, I know for a fact that we have brains and we have uh, talent solving a lot of problems. And then ask yourself, is that problem local to Tunisia, local to North Africa or local to Africa, but you have to think global. And then you go to that next stage in doing the lifty, the heavy lifting by with what I call FFF, family, friends and fools like me, you know, 5K here, 2K there, you know, saving a bank account. And I'm saying, I'm going to build a prototype or an MVP to basically show to the world that I've done it. I have something that I'm resolving this problem. So that's the second slide. The third one is um, a market fit and the total addressable market. And again, please don't give numbers for the hell of giving numbers. Do your research on the internet and you will always say, you will hear things like uh, the tourism syndicates uh, report 2023 said that 12 million uh, visitors came to Tunisia and most of them went to Sousse. That data is there if you are in travel tech, okay? And anything else for on any other, other technology. So you have to have the source of information. And then you say, I'm honest with myself. I'm a techie. I'm a financial guy. I'm a businessman. I cannot do this by myself. I'm not a Swiss knife. I cannot do, you know, because I'll be lousy doing a poorly, a poorly job. But I am a technical guy. So I'm, I'm putting a co-founder, usually a CTO or maybe a financial or a techie. Um, investors do not invest in solo entrepreneur. Just get it there up your head forever. I see seldomly that investors invest in solo entrepreneur. So you have to have that team concept uh, complementing each other. Um, that's basically the fourth slide uh, with the total adjustable market. And then you say, this is maybe, um, uh, what can I say? Uh, a very light, high level architecture, simple way of showing if you are want to demonstrate how it works, but you don't have to be technical at high level uh, because if somebody is interested, remember, you're only trying to hook one or two people that are interested. They will come back afterwards and do a deep tech 
deep tech, really thorough, thorough technical uh, due diligence and a financial diligence. They will do it, don't worry, before they invest. But that mission first, just show them maybe how uh, that product works. Talk a little bit about your business model. Uh, is it a SaaS? Is it a pay-as-you-grow? Is it a license, perpetual license for uh, an enterprise license? You know, business model, how are you going to be uh, basically monetizing uh, your... Uh, um, maybe one slide that a lot of founders have a problem with. It's called the financial slide. We're not expecting you to have, uh, you know, all the p and and all the accounting expected. Just one slide showing maybe uh, some costs, some OPEX, some CAPEX, some headcount, uh, a bit of forecast if you're forecasting something, uh, you know, in the next two or three years. One slide, no more than that, high level. And the last one, which is my favorite, because that's where most founders fail, but if it's on odds, it's called the ask light. You know, you wake up early in the morning, you did all this beautiful work, and you are pitching on Zoom to an American guy or to a European guy or whatever, or you go to the dot because there's some uh, business angels in town and you want to pitch at them, and you did a fantastic storytelling on the last slide, bingo, it's called the ask slide, and I can see things like, I'm looking for 10K, or I'm looking for 100K, and it's one sentence. That's it. And then they get surprised when you have blank faces of investors, because what you missed are sharing what you're looking for, you're looking for a couple of things. Uh, one of them is smart money. I'm looking for a partner, an investor that understands digital health. Be specific. Don't go around corners and let it open. Be specific. And um, on the term sheet, you know, um, it's a safe note for the time being because um, I want to, I'm starting, I want to build the value with this financial partner. Um, hopefully, it's going to be yourself. And then we decide eight minute, uh, eight, 18 months, two years, and next year, we open the safe and uh, we calculate the right evaluation uh, uh, appropriately and everybody wins. You can start like that. And then you'll say, I'm looking for someone that can coach me, mentor me, and open doors for me in France and Germany and Scandinavia. Be specific. Be specific. I'm looking for someone that I have, I have no clue. I know that I'm going to be very successful in South Africa and in Nigeria. I have no clue how to go there. Be specific. So the ask slide, I think, is the most important closing slide. And by the way, this is the money, how I'm going to be spending it. 30% uh, on R&D or 10%. Be specific. Don't be vague. And I feel that's why a lot of startups, especially in Africa in general, um, they're not going that extra mile to really hook the interest of any good investor. But for me, it's a missed opportunity. And by the way, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Lesson learned. You can come back and learn from it. You've been mentored at the right time, etc. And then you go back and do a better job. And um, finishing with that, body language, voice, tone, confidence, all play in that type of... Remember, those investors there, they are not your enemies. They are not uh, judging you uh, in a kind of a menacing or aggressive way. They just want to help. They want to invest for a return on investments. They want to hear a credible person telling them a good story. They want to dream that they are enabling a big fish, a big market. So that confidence, that body language have to be rehearsed. And, and I always say, hey, we have all iPhones, you know, we can go back to our bedrooms and uh, rehearse and rehearse. We have all the Apple Watch or clock to see that, you know, a seven minute pitch. I'm sorry. When somebody tell you it's a seven minute pitch, I'm sorry. You have no excuse. You have no excuse to mess it because you left maybe 
that most important slide, which was the ask, because you spent so much trying to make us understand what the problem is you're trying to resolve, or maybe how good, good or the solution you have. Waste of time. So that's the seven magic slides I always talk about, and then keep an appendix slide, and then at the end, you know, you can have all those slides you want because somebody will ask you something and then you will have it as a backup. Really interesting. You covered it all, Marcel, and thank you. And I hope the entrepreneurs that are watching or maybe re-watch since it's going to be registered on our Facebook page will benefit especially for those seven slides because, like we said, indeed, sometimes we miss the important thing, the ask, uh, or we ask in the wrong way, I need $1 billion, okay? It's acceptable, but for what? It's a lot of money uh, to do what exactly, to which market, or sometimes um, I hear it from investors or even from other startups, so especially during international events, I'm looking for an expansion to the Gulf region. Like it's like it's a small neighborhood near Tunis or an expansion to Africa. So this is sometimes why they miss the opportunity because like you mentioned since the beginning, they're not specific enough to mention what they're looking for and how the people can help them with the money or sometimes the network, it can worth more than the money that the investor can give you, you, on, you, one, you on one round you table. Bet. Marcel, I have a couple of questions from the audience and I don't want to hold you more. And really, we have more than an hour and it was really passionate. And again, thank you for your time. I know you are very busy. And directly to the question that we have received in the private. So one of the person that is following us asked, with, with your experience in promoting cross-border collaboration, how can Tunisian startups tap into investment opportunities from the Gulf or entrepreneur uh, or European market? Okay, just to put the video out for a second. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, I think from a cross-border perspective, first of all, let's make sure that you have, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Excellent. No, well, you are on mute, Marcel. Marcel, could you please unmute yourself? Just one second. Today is not my day with technical. Can you hear me? Now you are back. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay excellent. So um, the biggest uh, and I would say the most important uh, advice I can give for the gentleman or the lady asking this question: make sure that at home and Tunisia is blessed with a couple of uh, savvy uh, business angels and investors. And even, by the way, when I call uh, savvy investors, don't worry about the ticket. Don't worry about the ticket. It could be 1K dollars. It could be $3,000. It doesn't matter. You have to have an anchor, anchor, we call them the anchor national country investor. Why? Because me as an investor sitting in Nice or sitting in Qatar or sitting in Saudi or in the US, guess what? I will go back because we are lazy we're going to go back to that first investor and because he did a due diligence on you, we're going to ask him uh, for a Zoom call. We're going to ask him for his data room, all the due diligence he did on you. And this is where the cross-border uh, uh, investment comes in. Um, just one simple example, me personally, that I lived uh, 10 years ago, uh, when I started to invest, um, you're familiar with the term leading a deal or following up a deal. So leading a deal is when you bring something to the rest of your club. So Sofia Business Angels have 40 investors. 
So a company based in Switzerland from uh, FAFL, which is the Lausanne Polytechnic, very smart guy, doing machine learning and business intelligence all together before ChatGDP, by the way. And he came in to pitch at us. And I took him by the hand and I said, listen, I'm not promising you to invest by myself, but I need my peers, I need my friends of my club to give me a 360 view because by myself, I never invest by myself. I need that extra hand to have the view of other people. So the same thing like uh, somebody in Tunisia has a uh, small ticket in you. Same thing applies because he had a view and I'm asking to complement the view. So the guy came in, he was asking for 250K and we felt that the technology to develop needed more than 250K. So first of all, we liked him because he was kind of uh, not uh, thinking big. He said, I can have a shoestring 250, I'll, I'll, I'll struggle, but I will do it. And we convinced him he should have more money to do it. So what we did, we reached out to Galatasaray Business Angel. Anything I'm saying, you can check on the internet, you see them. Galata Business Angel is a Turkish uh, uh, association that um, we work with. We have Cambridge Business Angels in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, we have the Irish uh, Business Angel Association based in Cork. Uh, we have Berlin. Uh, we have Finban, Finnish Business Angel Network. So we're all connected like this. And um, I called Aisha Inal, the lady who uh, uh, take care of the Galatasaray Business Angel. I said, Aisha, I have an interesting uh, deal here. And we did all the due diligence on them. And I think um, you can match us. We put 250. We'd love you to follow us with 250. And uh, the only thing she asked me, she says, is there a market for this in Turkey? So think about it. That makes sense, right? Because by default, uh, you were saying earlier on, how to expand to the MENA region, how to expand to the GCC, how to expand to other markets. Well, guess what? Look, there's a Turkish marketplace that he never thought to have because he was not even thinking about it. He's sitting in Switzerland. And then I said, of course, he is interested in the Turkish market. So he got 250 plus 250, 500. And then the canton of Lausanne, that's how uh, Switzerland works, uh, is a government regional. And I'm sure the uh, same thing happened in Tunisia with some grants. Um, uh, like smart capital, sometimes they do a matching program. So they said, okay, you've got 500. Guess what? The canton of Lausanne matches that 500. And you got 1 million over a three month period. So while I'm trying to basically give you a hint, please, please do me a favor. There is someone who is like an angel, somebody who cares about you, somebody who believes in you, somewhere in Tunisia between SUS uh, ecosystem, uh, between SFAX. I heard a lot of good SFAX business people over there and, and Tunis itself. And um, if not, anybody's connected to Norman. I heard as well that he just got a $10 million uh, a euro fund uh, as well. So he's, he's investing in, uh, in, in some startups. So make sure you do your homework and get that one person I'm not asking you for two or three investors in Tunisia, just the one. Once you do that, that person is connected to Sofia Business Angels in Nice, uh, to France Angels. France Angels in France have 73 clubs across France, including ours. And as it happened, SBA is in the board of IBAN, which is the European Federation. So I have access to my friend in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in Spain, in Greece. And it goes on. And if somebody is saying, oh, I want to be connected to the US for whatever reason. Well, guess what? Most business angels are lazy. They pick up the phone to the American Association of Business Angels, be it San Francisco, Boston, Pittsburgh, Austin, Dallas. I mean, we know all of them and they know of us. So that's how it works. So that's my advice to him. He needs to be anchored by at least one person. And that person, I bet you, I can prove to you that he's network internationally for lots of reasons. Okay.
Perfect, Marcel. And maybe one last question, and it's in the same uh, in the same theme of the last one. So one of the people watching us asked, "What advice do you have for Tunisian entrepreneurs on tailoring their pitches to resonate with investors, particularly those from outside the region?" And what strategy can you give him uh, for better positioning themselves to attract investors outside Tunisia? So maybe I will start with the last sentence that you mentioned, looking for a local anchor. And what else? So it's the pitch. The pitch has to be a problem solving for a global market. When you have that slide on the total addressable market, and then you go down and you show uh, let's say the worldwide market of this particular AI machine learning system is 1.6 trillion. Um, we come back to EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa is 500 million. And then in Africa or North Africa is 200 million. And my addressable market in Tunisia that I'm going to start with is 25 million in the next three years. Well, guess what? What you're doing there by the way, with the source of information at the bottom of your slide, what you're doing there, you are telling the world that you are positioning your solution on a global basis. So by doing that thorough research and sharing it when you're pitching uh, to the rest, uh, uh, the, the best example for Tunisians, the biggest market for them is Africa and the MENA region. I mean, I'm telling you, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, is on fire and they love, they are absolutely impressed. The Khalij, as we call them, region, they're very impressed with Tunisian North African talent. That's why Jitex Africa uh, left Dubai last year and came to, to, to Marrakesh. So, so make sure you understand they already know of you that you have talents, but pitch yourself that you're solving the problem on a worldwide basis. And that slide of total addressable market and market fit, you're not saying it, but you're hinting at it by starting with the world number, coming in back to Africa, Africa to North Africa, North Africa to your country, saying this is the one I'm starting with, and then I'm going to expand there. But if you only mention I have a local problem that I'm resolving and the business is 5 million revenue in the next three years, well, guess what? You're not credible with the international uh, community of investors and nobody would even want to hear your story, even if it's incredible. And something else as well I advise, don't uh, talk about IP. Even if you have an IP, IP is good to have a big evaluation. I agree. But guess what? What is important? Go after the sales, go after your customer, be passionate with the customer, be passionate with sales. And, and, and go and, and steal the market? Or would you be waiting to, to get an IP registered? And before you know it, your competitor is eating your lunch. So sometimes you have to make the right decisions. Thank so you. this is the, in a nutshell what I have to say. Thank you, Marcel. And uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, one last question or what my one last ask before we leave you and again, Thank you for investing uh, in us with your time because yeah, you didn't give us money, but you gave us something way more valuable than money, in my opinion, which is your time and you're very busy these, time, these times. So thank you again. Thank you. Special thank you for Ashraf who is watching us, but help us with the technical issue. And the question that was asked also, if you accept other mentee, new mentee, of, if, or if one startup want to, wants to one startup want to get in contact with you, how should they do or what should they do or which channel? Very easy. I, I always say when I go, I um, yesterday I was in a class, a master class on go to market for 50 European. Uh, and, and I joked with them. I said, I will see by the end of my 45 minutes discussion with you, who is savvy enough to be asking me on LinkedIn to be a connection. That was the first hint I gave them. And then I challenged them immediately. Please, please, I beg of you, do some research on the profile of any investor. 
and and like I said, uh, my information. You just type my name on Google, you will see a lot of things that I've done in my life. Uh, make sure you understand where I can help you. Do not come blind and asking me questions that maybe I have nothing to do with your business, and maybe you're wasting your own time by talking to the wrong person. So please, if you feel I can help you, if you feel I can add value to you, I can mentor you, more than happy to do that, but try to impress me by telling me I did the research and I feel that you can help me here, uh, either from networking with someone, uh, opening a door in a particular company, or uh, advise me on my next round, what would be the best advice, which uh, network uh, of business angels or investors I should do, maybe which is the most active VC for Series A, if you're already growing, um, and what would be the best country to do soft landing, as an example. So so make sure you do your research first. Like we say in Tunisia, Lech <laughs> Alikum. So thank you, and we, try, we end our session in this fire sh side chat with you, Marcel, with the key inside, do your homework before anything, before starting a startup, before pitching, before reaching to Marcel or other investors. Uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you for the community that was watching. So we meet again for another event and enjoy your time in Brussels. Have a nice evening, Marcel. Bye-bye. Thank you. And good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The session is off.